Hello everyone, this is the Great Fez, and I'm here today to present the full flight of Kerpalo 2. Kerpalo 2 is a mission uh, using a Saturn V made from stock parts, uh, taking three crew and going to Minmus, landing and coming back. The entire mission will be um, autonomously guided except for a crew transfer using a mod called Kerbal Operating System, or KOS for short. It is a mod that allows you to write autopilot scripts uh, using the lang uh, KOS language. Um, so about five years ago, I actually made a video just like this. Uh, it was back when I uh, recently graduated from college, uh, just fresh off the, uh, the boat, I guess, from learning programming and, and getting my feet wet in this stuff. But since then, I've vastly improved my programming skills, um, definitely very much improved uh, my programming skills with, with reference to orbital mechanics and flight dynamics. So I wanted to uh, showcase this. Since it's been five years, I wanted to remake it um, to something much better. So uh, this is also my 1,000th hour of KSP. Um, so it's kind of a cool capstone project to, to finally finish it at this, at this time and then uh, make a video about it to, to present. Um, and then, of course, it's the Apollo 11 mission 50th anniversary. So uh, I wanted to make my own tribute the first time we landed on the moon. Um, the mission is broken down to 12 phases. Each one is just a major task or maneuver that's done by the ship. It's also a good way for me to separate out the script so I can uh, test each phase individually instead of having to run the entire mission as a, as a whole. Uh, and then lastly, uh, it follows along with Apollo 11's flight plan since I am using the Saturn V. I have to pretty much follow it, uh, but it doesn't follow it uh, to the T. I'm not trying to recreate you know, where they land or anything like that. Um, last two things I want to talk about before I get into the phases are the two utility scripts that I use a lot. Uh, the first one is the maneuver node execution script. Uh, this is in charge of doing any sort of maneuver node execution. So anytime that I make a, a maneuver node with KSP using KOS, I then use this script to, to execute those maneuvers to change my orbit. Um, the other one is uh, called change orbit. This is essentially a way to select the orbital elements that I want my orbit to be in. And orbital elements are uh, sort of like uh, the equivalent of GPS coordinates, but in this case it defines the shape of your orbit and what its orientation is. So uh, here are three that I use, the longitude of ascending node, the inclination, and the argument of periapsis. These essentially define which way your the orbit is, is oriented with a reference direction, a plane of reference. And then lastly, the actual shape uh, is defined by the periapsis and apoapsis distances. The script doesn't work, uh, or I haven't designed it to work with uh, hyperbolic orbits or anything like that. So it's just used, just uh, changes between elliptical orbits. But it, in order to put it into that orbit, it just create calculates and then creates several maneuver nodes to that then get executed by the previous utility script. So on to phase one, um, the uh, launch and circularization. The first part is done using the Ascent Evolution Series script, um, uh, specifically the acceleration, the pitch rate acceleration method. Uh, you guys can watch that in the in my Ascent Evolution Series if you're interested. Um, we're going to be launching to 400 kilometers apoapsis, and that is just to use up all of stage two. That way we're just using stage three and beyond to go to Minmus, and then uh, we're going to be circularizing at the apoapsis. And uh, for those that don't know what it means to circularize, in orbital mechanics, um, a circular orbit is one that is, of course, circular, but in order to achieve that, you first need to make sure that a your velocity vector is perpendicular to your position vector and the speed is constant and is uh, dependent on this equation here where uh, mu is the gravitational parameter which is calculated by g uh, and the mass of the planet and then r is the distance to the center of the planet so you use that to calculate the velocity and uh, if you get your velocity vector to be perpendicular and its magnitude to be this value that's how you get a circular orbit um, the so where do you want to circularize your orbit? If you want to use the least amount of fuel, you want to do it either at the periapsis or the apoapsis. And that is because at those two points, your velocity vector will actually be perpendicular to your position vector. So that means that you don't have to spend any fuel turning the velocity vector. Um, 
to then align it, you know, to be perpendicular and then and then change the magnitude to be uh, whatever uh, whatever your altitude is or whatever the value is for your altitude to be in a circular orbit. So um, that's what generally happens in, in KSP. A lot of people just do, uh, you know, they launch from Kerbin and then put their uh, circularization at the Apple Apsis to use the least amount of fuel. That isn't to say you can do it either, you know, at somewhere else along the orbit, like point B or point C. But if you notice, point B is not perpendicular to the velocity, to the position vector, sorry. So you'd have to use a lot, either a lot of fuel or um, a bit of fuel more than you would at the Apple Apsis to turn the velocity vector. So um, it, it really doesn't matter where you use it. It depends on your delta V budget, but if you can, you always want to do it either at the periapsis or the apoapsis. Um, so with that, I'll cut to the video of the launch and circularization. Uh, all the videos that I'll be showing of the actual flight are probably going to be sped up except for some instances. Um, so don't be alarmed. It didn't actually happen that fast, but it's just to cut down on time since some of them are pretty long. Nobody wants to sit there and watch a rocket burn for, you know, three minutes or something like that. But I'll be back when that's finished. All right, so after phase one is phase two, where we're going to be intercepting with Minmus. Uh, first thing that we're going to do is match the two orbital planes together, and you do that by matching the inclination and the longitude of ascending node. And this is, I do this for pretty much all the analysis that I do. I try to simplify things um, as much as I can. That's why everything usually gets put into circular parking orbits. Um, but once you match the two orbital planes, it essentially becomes a 2D analysis. Uh, so it's much easier to do than, uh, say, a 3D analysis uh, of orbits. Um, and then from there, we're going to be doing a Hohmann transfer. Uh, so what is a Hohmann transfer and how do you intercept or use it to intercept is what this will be talking about here. Um, the Google Doc, uh, I've made actual Google Doc talking about phase angles and how to, to do all the math there. So I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, as far as the math goes. You can check that out. Um, second of all, I want to talk about what this diagram here represents. This will be Kerbin. The blue line is our parking orbit. Uh, our ship will be at A. Um, our target Minmus will be in the red, and it's this point B. And then this green dotted line is the home and transfer. Um, so. The way you do it is, first off, a Hohmann transfer is just a series of two burns to get you from one altitude to another. It's actually the most efficient way to do it, uh, since it's essentially, you know, just creating two burns at the most efficient places possible and at the periapsis and the apoapsis of this transfer orbit. Uh, it's also a great way to, to, to just get change your one circular orbit to another, but usually you won't use it to get to another altitude. Um, so that's what a tr home and transfer is. So we're going to be using that because it's easiest to analyze, at least for me, and it's very efficient. So the first thing you need to do is calculate what the delta V you need for you to put yourself in this transfer orbit to get from this radius R2 to, or sorry, R1 to R2. Second thing is you need to calculate how long this takes because since you want to intercept, we're going to assume that when you get to point C, you're Minmus will also be there. Um, and then we walk backwards in time, right? Uh, if you walk backwards in time, you'll know that by the time you get to A, your ship, that B will also have moved backwards there to uh, this point here. And the angle that the two make when you're when you start in this uh, backwards time walking thing, uh, you'll get the 
you'll calculate what's called the phase angle. You you measure this angle, and that's what you need the ship and minimus to be, so that when you perform this transfer orbit, they'll both be at C, uh, and you're able to intercept and then you know do whatever you need to do there. Uh, so once you know this phase angle, then that gives you uh, the orientation that these two need to be at, and then you just need to find the time along your, your parking orbit where that will occur. Uh, you place your maneuver node there, and then you execute the maneuver node. It's it's pretty simple. The math is a little bit involved. You can look at it there, but um, it's, not, it's not too bad. So uh, with that in mind, I'll let you guys watch that part, and then uh, I'll come back whenever we're, capture, we're at Minmus, and then we'll begin phase three. All right, so now we're in phase three. Uh, we need to capture ourselves with Minimus so we don't leave, and then we also need to establish our parking orbit wall where the lunar module is going to wait while the lander does its landing maneuver. Um, first thing is uh, reducing our speed and uh, our, and or our specific orbital energy. This is to ensure that our orbit is elliptical and within its the sphere of influence of Minimus. Uh, otherwise, we'll be escaping or what's called uh, being an escape trajectory, and I'll talk about that later in the video. Uh, the second thing is that we need to ensure that we're going prograde uh, along the orbit, which just means that our orbit rotates at the same uh, direction that the moon is traveling. And that's just to save a lot of headaches and fuel for doing landing uh, and, and launching from a, a, a planet that's or body that's rotating. And then second of all, we're just going to be using that orbit change script to put ourselves in a circular orbit with a radius of 30 kilometers and inclination of zero. Uh, so I'll be back when that is finished and we'll move on to phase four. All right, now that we're in our parking orbit, we begin phase four, which is uh, the part where the lunar module is going to decouple, turn around, dock with the lander, and detach it from the third stage. Um, so that that's pretty much how the logic is going to work. It's 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 relatively simple. Uh, the two the lunar module is going to flip, flip around first to align the two docking ports, then zero out all its relative velocity, uh, proceed to uh, align the two docking ports, and then approach. Um, once the magnet effect, which is something that happens in KSP, uh, starts to take into effect with the two docking ports, then all the controls are let go and then it just uh, coasts until it's docked. And then we can proceed to the next phase uh, where we're going to be doing all the crew transfer and then landing in one go.
All right, now that we've detached, we can begin phase five uh, and phase six. Uh, those will, two will be together in the video since phase five is pretty simple and short. Uh, phase five consists of me having to manually move over two crew members from the lunar module to the um, lander. Unfortunately, I had to do that because KOS doesn't let you do that autonomously. So it's the, one of the times where I had to break my um, the autonomy. But after you do that, the, the, the uh, the script continues on and it sends a message to the lander to continue uh, running this, the its portion, which is the deorbit and the landing phase. Um, so the target position where I'm going to be landing, I just chose it arbitrarily. I, the only condition that I had was that it's nice and flat, which you can do in a lot of places in Minmus, and that it was above or below the um, or the uh, equator. And I wanted to do that because it gives me a bit of a challenge to do. So the second part is that we're going to be doing um, an inclination change uh, and then a Hillman transfer. I'll explain why that I do that uh, in a little bit. Uh, then we're going to be using a solver to put it in the correct spot. And then, of course, after um, the Hillman transfer is finished and we get close to the periapsis, we'll begin the landing phase, which consists of two, phase, two different uh, guidance schemes, the horizontal overshoot avoidance and the terminal guidance. Um, so how to achieve the latitude, the first thing that you need to know is that uh, whenever you make a maneuver node, or whenever you make an inclination change in a circular orbit um, that's on the equator, then your the latitude of uh, the maximum latitudes will actually occur either 90 degrees or 270 degrees from that maneuver node. That's that's a, always a fact, it's just a, a, a consequence of geometry. So. Knowing that, if I put then a Hillman transfer 90 degrees um, after this maneuver node, then I know that my periapsis will be 270 degrees from where I started, meaning that my periapsis will be at the target latitude. So I've essentially cut this down to uh, where I need to put these maneuver nodes because I know that my target latitude is going to be reached at the exact altitude that I want it to be at. Uh, and I could show that here. So first thing is uh, the inclination change. Um, it's not a, it's not a si uh, the altitude of this uh, orange orbit is the same. It's just inclined, so it looks like it's a little smaller. But uh, after 90 degrees, I then create a, a, a Hillman transfer maneuver node here, and then 180 degrees be the periapsis. And I and um, because of geometry, I know that uh, the target latitude will be reached right there. So the only thing that's left to fix is the longitude, and you do that by first uh, calculating where your longitude is going to be once you reach the uh, the periapsis here. Uh, and the ship, the, or I'm sorry, the body is still going to be rotating, so then you need to subtract that out using this longitude difference equation here. Um, and I believe you need to add it if the if you're going retrograde, if you if you need to be in a retrograde orbit. But for a prograde orbit, you need to subtract it. Um, and then you, once you do that calculation, you can find where the actual longitude is going to be, or where your your ship is going to be longitude-wise when you reach the periapsis. Uh, then you can just do some simple logic. Uh, you create a solver. You can do a hill climber. I use a bisection method to move the start time of that maneuver node until I got to uh, the correct spot. Um, uh, and then once I, I I cut it off so that I was within one second of that correct spot. Um, this is a, a quick diagram of what what uh, what's going to be happening for the landing portion. Or, or, uh, so first deorbit, uh, then we coast to the perigee, and then we're going to be doing our landing burn. Um, the landing burn consists, of, or I'm sorry, the landing uh, landing phase consists of two guidance schemes. The first one is to ensure that I don't pass over the um, uh, the target, so I'm going to be slowing down so I can actually la fall down and land. Otherwise, I'll you know we'll just continue going into the into the orbit that I'm already at. Um, and this also does a nice phase of of efficiently uh, eliminating all the energy from from my orbit, um, or not all of it, but a lot of it. Uh, second part is the actual terminal guidance where we're going to be homing in on the target position. Again, it's not really necessary for me to land at a specific spot. I made all my calculations to be uh, agnostic of where I land, but it's always really nice to see how close I can get to it. So uh, I'll be using proportional navigation to ensure that uh, to, to point the ship in the right direction and then a suicide burn calculation to ensure that I touch down at a, a decent at a slow enough speed, but also in a very efficient manner.
So proportional navigation is, um, uh, I wanted to explain this since uh, it's a, a lot of people don't know what this is, but it's, it is a very popular way to, to do homing, homing missiles or just missiles in general and how to, um, to, to guide them to the target. Um, and this is also used, uh, th this kind of methodology is also used by ship navigators since um, if your line of sight between two uh, objects is the same when they're heading towards each other, they're going to be in a collision course. So if you're on a boat and you notice another ship is heading towards you or, uh, or into your line of path uh, and you notice that they, their orientation is not changing, that means that you two are going to be in a collision course. So you need to make some maneuvers so you don't hit each other. Um, the calculations uh, you can look at at Wikipedia. It's a decently simple uh, algorithm, but you just calculate the the angle that this uh, I'm sorry the rate that this angle is changing, and then with that you can calculate the normal force to apply to your missile so that you're going to be hitting the target. Um, so with that, uh, I'll let you guys watch that. It's uh, I'll, I'll try to keep the landing portion as as uh, as not uh, sped up as much because it's pretty fun to watch. Um, but everything else is pretty. Uh, 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 I'll speed that up to cut down on time. All right, so the lander has landed very nicely. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed watching that. It's always a pleasure for me to watch that. I'm pretty proud of that script. Um, now we're going to be detaching from the lander portion and just ascending with the land, uh, ascent engine. Um, the first thing it's going to do is just going to do an initial vertical kick and then pitch over like immediately to do to start accelerating horizontally. And this is not the same uh, kind of uh, line of work that the launch uh, um, or the launch functions that I've been using in my ascent evolution are using because this is it doesn't have any air so I can just immediately start pitching over. Uh, we're just going to be maintaining a 10 degree flight path angle until we reach the desired cutoff uh, and that's just to make sure that I'm not you know just hovering above the ground and there's some hill that I run into. Um, and uh, then we're going to circularize at 60 kilometers. Uh, one thing to do 
that you will note is that we have to wait till 3,000 kilometers altitude to time warp. This is a minimum specific thing because uh, KSP has a cap on how uh, when you can do on rails war uh, time warping. So um, there's a limit of 3,000 kilometers minimum. So we just have to wait until then. Uh, after that, we'll be doing the rendezvous with the uh, lunar module. So that'll be fun too. All right, so we have ascended and now we're in an inclined parking orbit. Um, the next part will be phase eight, which is rendezvous with the lunar module. Uh, this script actually follows pretty much the exact same calculations as the one that we used to intercept with Minmus, except for the very last part, there's added logic to actually rendezvous with the uh, vessel. Um, so uh, again, we're gonna be matching the orbital planes of the two. That's uh, by changing the longitude of ascending node and the inclination of the lander. And then uh, do the the transfer orbit uh, or the home and transfer to rendezvous with the ship. Um, then after we do those, those uh, perform those maneuver nodes, then we're gonna be uh, using this last part, which is actually to do the rendezvous. And in this case, we're, the first thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna ensure that our relative velocity vector points towards the target. Um, and then second of, second of all, after that logic is finished, we use pro-nav and, su and a suicide burn calculation to, um, to one, make sure that we get to the target, and two, to get there as quickly as possible. That's just to save time, uh, and also to make sure that I can get there uh, as close as possible, or to get the two close enough that we can begin phase nine, which is the docking portion. And uh, I'll let you guys watch that, and I'll come back when uh, we can begin phase nine. All right, now that we've got the two ships close together, we can begin phase nine, which is the lander docking to the lunar module. Uh, in this case, uh, the only difference that it was from before is that now the lunar uh, module gets a message from the lander to align itself and cut down on some of the work that the lunar the lander has to do. Uh, then it uses the same logic as before, same exact script to do the docking, and then we can begin the next phase, which is phase 10 through 12. With the lander now redocked to the lunar module, we can begin phase 10, which is uh, crew transfer again, um, but this time it's going from the lander to the lunar module. Same kind of logic as before, it's just counting how many are in each, and then once the uh, everyone's back onto the lunar module, it sends the message to begin phase 11. Uh, before I do that though, I wanna talk about this concept of what a escape trajectory is, uh, and I'm going to explain it what it is in the real world because it, I think it's interesting, and what it, it is a distinction in KSP. So, an escape trajectory is essentially an um, uh, an orbit that has enough energy to escape the gravity well. So you're going fast enough that uh, no matter what happens, uh, you'll never come back to the body. Um, 
So uh, that, that that's what the concept of uh, escape velocity is. I'm sure you guys have heard that before. You can actually calculate it using um, the specific orbital energy. When your specific orbital energy is zero, you will have uh, escape velocity for that altitude. Um, so there's two specific kinds of escape trajectories. First off is parabolic. That's when you have exactly enough to escape. Uh, and that means that your eccentricity is exactly one. Your escape velocity equals um, your, or your velocity equals the escape velocity. Uh, and then there's also the hyperbolic orbit where you have your um, velocity is greater than the escape velocity. Uh, meaning that whenever you leave, you'll actually have more um, uh, that you can, uh, you'll, whenever you leave the influence of the gravity well, you'll still have a, a excess amount of velocity. Um, so in KSP, it's a little bit different because KSP uses a, uses a sphere of influences to hard cut uh, where the body is going to be acting on you gravitationally. So um, once you pass that sphere of influence, you're no longer you essentially escape the gravity well of that body. Now that doesn't mean that um, you could be in a trajectory that will put you back into the the sphere of influence, but um, you, uh, you still have escaped it for the time being. Um, now, the two things that I wanted to point out here, they're not really important for any analysis, but uh, just a good distinction for what I'll be talking about is one is that uh, escape trajectories in KSP do not have to be parabolic or hyperbolic. You can actually be in an elliptical orbit, but your altitude of your apoapsis is beyond the sphere of influence, so you've actually left the um, body's influence. Or two, it doesn't have to possess a, a minimum amount of energy. Those, that concept is not really used for escape trajectories either. Uh, I do want to note that that sphere of influence analysis uh, is actually used in the real world as well. It's actually very helpful to make this problem much simpler. For example, when you're doing stuff around Earth, you don't really care about uh, the sun or the moon or anything like that, usually because uh, they're so far away that the, the influence is very significant, insignificant. But uh, once you get close to the moon, however, you, you want to switch over to analyzing it as that's the main body. Um, so how I did my escape trajectory calculation is I made it, uh, I made some simplifications uh, by ensuring that one, the planes of the two orbits, uh, my escape trajectory and the the actual orbit of Minmus around Kerbin are the same. That will mean that, again, I turn this into a two-dimensional problem, which makes it much easier to analyze. And second of all, I calculate it so that the escape trajectory, or I'm sorry, the exit velocity, this V infinity here, is equal to, uh, or is parallel to the body's um, velocity around uh, Kerbin. And that makes it so that I can just add the two together, and it makes it so eventually I have a cap, right? If I if my exit velocity equals the planet's velocity, then I'll be at zero, and I'll just fall directly to Kerbin. So it kind of gives me a cap of where um, uh, where to put, because uh, the analysis that I do here is I just give it a desired exit speed, and then uh, I calculate what the periapsis is, and then I use a solver to get it to 30 kilometers uh, periapsis. Um, so um, th this is a breakdown of, of how phase 11 will work. Um, it's going to match the orbital planes using that uh, change orbit script, and then it's going to calculate the speed that needed to um, reach a 30 kilometer uh, periapsis at Kerbin. And the reason for that is one, it's within the, the atmosphere, so I can actually begin aerial braking. And two, it's a ballpark number that I've gotten from the years of experience and from you know, forums and stuff on, on KSP uh, that will uh, allow you to actually be captured at Kerbin, but you're not going to burn up. Um, it's just ballpark. It says <laughs> don't follow this as a rule. Uh, and then lastly, once we get to Kerbin, or, or once we finish that burn, we'll begin phase 12, um, which is just a coasting all the way until we're in, in the uh, Kerbin atmosphere. And then once we do that, we detach and then just wait until we're uh, low enough, or at least 10,000 kilometers, uh, or sorry, 10 kilometers. Um, and then we deploy the parachute and just wait for landing. Um, so that's it. Uh, the rest of this is just going to go through 10, 10 through 12 because they're pretty simple and they fall through. Hope you enjoyed watching this video. Um, uh, I don't, I don't need any sort of likes, share, subscribe. But if you do have any comments or questions, feel free to ask. Um, uh, and also, uh, if you want to join the Discord on KOS, uh, uh, you can find us on our subreddit and links to it.
feel free to ask me questions there. I'm always there to help anybody or just to discuss this kind of stuff. All right, thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of it.